sci-fi, horror, fantasy, absurdism in the extreme. It's all available here in the Tales from the Omni Vault book series. Check the description for Amazon links so you can get your copies and start reading today. Thank you all, and now, on to the video. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omni Viewer, and even though I'm sure you can tell from the sound of my voice I'm still feeling a bit under the weather, I was still feeling good enough to grab the second issue of Ultraman X Avengers to see if the series is still going well. This is the officially the halfway point, by the way. This is the middle of the story. And I guess quickly before I get into the meat of the comic itself, I have finally caught up with the mystery of Ultra 7, which was the last arc of the solo Ultraman series before the crossover happened. I know a lot of you guys told me that it was the best part of that, uh, that solo series, and you were right. It definitely is the best part of that comic. And I think I know why. Ironically, it's because that's the book where Marvel does what Marvel does best. It puts the heroes against each other in a fight, as opposed to having the heroes fight disposable villains. Because that's what Marvel tends to excel at, right? You have a few superheroes who have some really iconic rogues galleries. You know, Spider-Man's got the best villains in the whole Marvel Universe. The Fantastic Four brought us Galactus and Doctor Doom. And I'm sure there are others. But for the most part, where Marvel seems to be at its best and where it always seems to be more interested is when it's taking its heroes and having them be at each other's throats as opposed to doing their jobs and fighting evil. That's where you get stories like Daredevil versus the Punisher, the Avengers versus the X-Men, literally everybody versus the Hulk, things like that. So this particular series has Ultraman up against Ultra 7, and then the Ultra Guard swoops in with their giant robot version of Jack, which I think was actually a good change, because Ultraman Jack, not exactly the most visually distinct Ultraman, because I think he was originally meant to be the OG Ultraman before they decided not that he was different. So having him be a robot, good choice. But again, you have that three-way struggle between characters who are all good guys being manipulated by the shadowy villain. And, you know, in a Marvel comic, of course, that's what makes the most sense. Still, a good arc is a good arc, though it still has a lot of the same issues that I was not too thrilled about with the Marvel Ultraman from the beginning. Anyway, though, now that I'm all caught up, I don't know if it's really affecting my views on Ultraman X Avengers all that much, because the crossover, while in continuity, is supposed to stand on its own uh, as well. And I do think this book does some interesting stuff, because after setting up Galactus, by the end of this book, Galactus does arrive on Earth, and the book does something that I think is very important to this being an entry in the Ultra series. Ultraman tries to negotiate with Galactus. That's something that can get overlooked by certain people in the Ultra series. There's always an attempt to reason with the aliens. When it comes to the monsters, they're giant animals, so they're treated like when animals are on a rampage. They have to be either contained or, if necessary, put down. You can't necessarily reason with them all the time. Sometimes you can, but most of the time you can't. Aliens... The aliens are sentient, so you should be able to reason with them. The thing is, 99 times out of 100, they're always going to say, nope, we have no interest in sharing the planet or calling off our invasion or shutting down our doomsday device ourselves. We just want to wipe out mankind. So that's when the Ultra Heroes have to step in and be like, okay, gave you a chance, but you asked for it, and you know how things go from there. So... Having them do that with Galactus as well, completely in character. Different from what we usually see in the Ultra series, but it still works. The only thing I think doesn't quite work is that after the negotiations fail, because the, the, the thing that makes it different from your usual Ultra entries is that negotiations in the classic Ultra series usually happen on the human scale. 
and then the alien grows to giant proportions, which requires the Ultra Hero to step in. Here, Ultraman is at full height, full power, and negotiates with Galactus that way. And when the negotiations fall through, Ultraman just turns around and leaves. I, I felt like that was not really in character. It seems like, okay, he's starting to devour the planet, and you're just gonna waltz away and let everyone know it didn't work? He's right there. Punch him. <laughs> but um, I think that was done purely so he could go back and be part of the team for the beginning of the next issue. So, a bit of a contrivance, plot convenience there, whatever. I still appreciate that they took the time to actually have him talk to Galactus first. And by the way, I, get, I once again want to say, choosing Galactus to be the main antagonist here makes total sense. Seeing Galactus and Ultraman standing opposite each other feels like it could have been right out of any series. In fact, I kind of want to see it done in one of the live action shows now. If, if this deal get, bears any fruit elsewhere, I would just love for them to have an episode of some Ultra series in the future where Ultraman actually does encounter Galactus. Because it makes perfect sense. He looks like he would be the kind of giant alien that would appear in the series. So, you know, that part works. But there's something about this issue that really stands out. So, I mentioned before, but the crossover is only three issues long, which is officially one of the shorter of such crossovers I've encountered. Justice League vs. Godzilla vs. Kong got seven issues, uh, Godzilla vs. Power Rangers has five issues. Th those seem to be the standard length, but this has only got three. And I think the evidence apparent in this book tells me that it, the original plan was not for it to be three issues. That it probably was supposed to be longer, but it got severely truncated. Because throughout all of issue two, the gas pedal is flush with the floor. It is just going, going, going at a, such a breakneck speed that it feels like some things are actually skipped over or they happen so quickly that it defies explanation. The Avengers are breaking into the Science Patrol on one page, very next page. They've already gone through all of security and are confronting Morheim. Ultraman and Captain Marvel go off to face these two kaiju that are attacking the city simultaneously, and they're dealt with before Ultraman's color timer even starts to blink. Kiki Fuji suddenly has this feeling of inadequacy and timidness, even though she's been a fairly confident member of the team up to this point. And so Tony Stark decides to make her a suit that's ready in no time at all. And I literally mean that because the infiltration of the Science Patrol base and the Kaiju battle are happening simultaneously. Kiki expresses her concerns and Stark says he's going to help her right before those two simultaneous scenes happen. And at the end of the Avengers side of things, she shows up in this Iron Woman suit that's already completely made for her. And again, if we're assuming that these scenes take place at the same time, and Ultraman is still under the three minute mark, then how did Stark build a suit that quickly? And so specifically, did, did he have one on standby or something? Did he just call it in from the other universe? I mean, that had to have happened ridiculously quickly. Plus, Fuji's reason for even getting the suit, that feels like it needed way more build-up and payoff. Where she's suddenly gone from, I'm a full member of this team, I outrank even Hayata, who was a rookie what, in the first arc. And, you know, she's not a jerk about it, but she's a full member of the team, very confident, very competent. And then suddenly she's like, I don't feel right in this room surrounded by superhumans and aliens, oh, woe is little old me. It just came out of nowhere, and the solution is provided just as quickly. I don't think that was the original plan, though. I think what happened is 
we were supposed to see this happen a bit more gradually over a longer period of time where all of this stuff that's happening with superheroes from other dimensions coming in and a planet-eating alien showing up, that was supposed to sort of start picking away at Fuji a little, like, you know, I used to be on top of my game with this, but now the monsters are showing up more frequently, there's this Ultra Guard with their giant robot, there are, of course, two Ultra Heroes now, superheroes are coming in from another dimension, I'm feeling useless now, and that would have weighed on her a little bit more, and eventually Stark would have gone, okay, look, I've been working on something behind the scenes, try this out for size. With a little more space and a little more pacing, I think that arc could have worked. Instead, it's just literally two minutes of her having self-doubt, and then suddenly she's Iron Woman. Yeah, and like I said, this thing feels like it wanted to be longer, and it probably should have been longer. I'm starting to think that maybe part of the reason why it took so long for us to get this series in the first place is because there was a lot of work being done on a longer story that the writers were suddenly told they had to chop in half, or maybe chop off more than half. So, it definitely feels rushed. I don't know if that makes it a better problem or a worse problem than the Justice League Godzilla crossover where it's sort of taken its time in the first few issues and then suddenly it has to get to the end without fully explaining anything. At least so far this book has explained everything it's brought up. But you know, it definitely should have been longer. The thing that really has me concerned, though, is that I don't know what's going to come next. Y you know, for a long time, I was one of the few people who was saying that we can't completely write off the idea that the MonsterVerse would end after 2020's Godzilla vs. Kong, which wound up being 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong, because just because there was no news didn't mean there was no news, right? And... Part of the reason I felt that confidence was because, you know, movies are a fairly mainstream medium, right? And historically speaking, even if a movie doesn't do that well in theaters, there are ways it can make up for it after the fact that will justify its continued existence and any potential sequels. You know, there's home media sales, there's merchandise, now we have digital downloads and streaming numbers and whatnot. So, a movie that underperforms at the box office can still find life in other platforms. Comics are a little different though. Comics are a very niche medium and they've been on life support for a very long time. I'm pretty much convinced that the only reason either Marvel or DC are still around is because they're each owned by mega corporations that are mining them for content in other mediums. And if that weren't the case, they probably would have filed for bankruptcy a long time ago. Maybe even formed a merger, who knows? Uh, Image Comics is probably largely sustained by the fact that Todd McFarlane is also manufacturing a, a bunch of toys under McFarlane Toys. I don't know what the deal is with Dark Horse. IDW uh, is practically dead these days from what I understand. And comics don't necessarily have that same sort of advantage that a movie might have. So it's kind of... Co comics is a medium that you kind of have to support as its own medium. And with the Ultraman Avengers crossover in particular, I'm not so sure it's doing too well. See, when I... Every time I went to the this comic book shop to get the individual issues of the Justice League vs. Godzilla vs. Kong crossover, they always had at least three different copies, one with a primary cover and two variant covers. I know there are way more variant covers than that, but they, you know, they made their choices of which ones they wanted. And that was consistent for all seven issues, which told me these books must have been selling well because, well, 
you wouldn't be ordering these things if they weren't selling well, right? The variant covers, of course, they don't change the content inside, but they're for the collectors, the people who want to have those variants to resell or to frame on their walls or something. So, you know, it's an extra expense, sure, but if you're going to keep doing them, that must mean there is a market for them. They had that same variation with the first issue of Ultraman X Avengers, where you had the main cover and two variant covers, and I picked up all three. I went to the shop to get issue two. Well, you may notice I've only got the one issue. Normally at the beginning, if there are variants, I would at least show you that I got the variants. No such dice here. This is the only one they had. Well, not the only issue, that there were multiple copies of this one, but no variants. And there were still a few leftover copies of issue one on a nearby shelf. Yeah, I think that might be a bad sign. Plus the fact that this book was actually delayed by a couple of weeks. And of course there's the fact that there really is no news about the future. I mean... The last thing we heard after the Mystery of Ultra 7 was that there was going to be an Avengers crossover at some point, and then there, it was just radio silence, until suddenly Marvel announced that not only was the crossover happening, we were also getting a separate crossover as a manga. Eventually, we were going to have both of those different crossovers collected in their own paperbacks for sale sometime next year, and then... There is no and then as of this particular posting. I've been looking. I haven't seen or heard anything. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if anybody at Supro is thinking they aren't getting the best out of this particular deal, or if they're waiting to see how this crossover does before continuing. At this point, the only evidence we have that the series is meant to continue is that Ultra 7, the mystery of Ultra 7 arc, ended on a cliffhanger. But, you know, there's... The, that alone doesn't necessarily guarantee anything. The entertainment world is filled with cliffhanger endings that were meant to be expanded on, but weren't, across pretty much every medium you can think of. So... I really don't know what the deal is here, but I do have my concerns. Who knows? Maybe things will pick up. As for the crossover itself, I mean, like I said, it's feeling incredibly rushed, and I have no idea how they're going to deliver a satisfying ending if they haven't really had the chance to properly build the story. But, um... Yeah, I'm not sure what else to say. This is a very rushed comic, and I can tell that it wasn't supposed to be, which is unfortunate. But we'll see what happens when the third issue comes along at the end of the month, unless that gets delayed too. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer signing off.